in the EU. More of the focus has been on the access that users have to their data. How you know the you know how you can control what is done with your data. Was if you really look at the approach that we have in the US, uh, the US is more around securing the data, protecting the data purely from a, a protection standpoint, and less on the access that is given to users to their data. I do find looking at uh, privacy in Canada versus the US versus Europe that. The, that the Canadian approach is a bit of a middle way between the way the EU looks at it and the US looks at it. And maybe that's maybe something worth exploring. Hello, everyone. I'm Sergio Maldonado, and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy, and technology with a clear goal in mind, which is redefining the relationship between people, brands, and media around transparency and control which is to say we're aiming for real customer centricity, or if you will, human centricity. We regularly talk to DPOs, CMOs, CDOs, and whoever else we find interesting and able to share valuable insights. So we hope you like it. Please do reach out if you have any ideas on future topics or speakers. Okay, we're joined by Stefan Greenweiss today, and he's a lawyer admitted to practice in multiple jurisdictions. It's pretty impressive. Also a privacy practitioner and DPO across the EU, the UK, the US and Canada for the past 20 years. His own firm offers outside DPO services for a number of companies on both sides of the pond. And he's also a partner specialized in international privacy at Outside GC, a US law firm with presence on the West and East coasts. Stefan teaches at various universities and writes for the IAPP Privacy Advisor. With him, we're going to have a second look at the differences between the EU and the US when it comes to data protection and how that transpires into data transfers after Joe Biden's executive order within that data privacy framework. And as we did in our last interview, we will take a quick look at the Canadian approach in case it can provide some inspiration. Let's get started. Stefan, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. No, I appreciate the opportunity. And I think it's great that we get to talk about what constitutes the differences in the approach to privacy between the EU and the um, and North America and the US. Yes. Yes. You're diving straight in. So please. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, give us a, a bit of an intro, please. Yeah. Well, I mean, above and beyond the differences really in focus on what constitute privacy, which is different historically. And I'll go back to how it all started, I think. In my, in my view, when you look at what built the entire privacy framework in the EU was really coming out of the Second World War when we thought there were a lot of abusers by the government in occupied territory of personal information of users, of individuals, for a purpose which was really not uh, intended um, by the collection at the time, which uh, in, in order to discriminate people based on religion, race and everything, a lot of the work that was done after the war was really on curbing the use that was made of that data by uh, by governments and uh, and and right or wrong, whether we write in that assertion or not, we, we feel that today the government is pretty much there to protect you. We trust government and we, and, and if there's some mistrust in what is done with the data, it's probably of corporations, what they do with our data. And, and you know, and uh, and I think that's, and if you kind of transfer that over to the US and you look at historically, uh, a lot of the approach in North America is is actually more on, on you know, we, we, we don't like government. We don't like government telling us what to do. And there's a big distrust in government using your data and for, Again, a reason that is kind of tied to the history, we we kind of feel comfortable with corporations handling our data. And so when you have a clash of those two systems, you know, and you look at how privacy was developed in the EU, because we trust government, government historically has been governing the air of privacy by way of directives, by way of uh, principles that came from the top down, where essentially we create a framework where um, you know, we we tell, you know, uh, essentially what companies can do, not do, 
and and we protect users within we protect users by way of those types of regulations now if you go to the us you see that there's very little interventionism when it came to privacy unless we believe there's a major risk with the, to, to the data and in that case we reactively pass legislation to protect certain categories of data in certain sectors and everything and on the other side we tend to trust the industry to self-regulate we don't feel that the risk is at the corporation level we feel that the risk is more the government misusing our data so when you take those two systems and those two impressions you you realize that it's somehow sometimes difficult to communicate um you know as a result of the development of privacy on both sides in the in the eu more of the focus has been on the access that users have to their data how you know the you know how you can control what is done with your data was if you really look at the approach that we have in the us uh the us is more around securing the data protecting the data purely from a, a protection standpoint and less on the access that is given to users to their data and it, it, it and it's interesting because in the in the context of transferring data from um you know the eu to the us there's a bit of a mistrust again that once it gets sent over to the us the us government is going to protect the data the way that uh, we do uh, in the in the eu but again i i personally think and i don't know if you agree with me sergio being yourself a, an expert in the field that just because data is not protected using the same frame of reference that we have in the eu it doesn't necessarily mean that it's less protected it is protected differently because the approach is different very good uh you know what surprised me if you want to start on one side of the pond perhaps you know is that we managed to agree on a common ground across the eu because even within the eu the fact that the uk was part of the eu at the time that we had the gdpr and it was agreed and we've got germany and i know that we've got a sort of napoleonic you know common civil code in the continent so you know italy france germany spain but still cultures were very different well we come from a common history right so yes we are very different country to country but our history is common uh, you know historically it's been a, a a history of wars um you know so we are we are aware of what is it that brings us together and 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 i think that in a way um you know we've because i said a lot of the regulation is really um coming from the top down in the eu getting governments to talk to one another and and agreeing to kind of force your way through parliament and the way things get done in the eu is actually not necessarily the path of most resistance you would think that you know governments can agree that we all have a common objective which is really to agree what should be the principles around a certain set of terms now if you look at the regulation as you know the regulation is not a normal regulation and is a political animal most regulations are automatically applicable across the eu but if you look at gdpr gdpr is an imperfect regulation because it only handles 80% of what the law of the land is and for 20% of those it still leaves it up to the the countries to decide because we talk about fundamental rights and you know what we talk about the charter of fundamental rights and uh, that is common to all of the eu so you can look at it this way and say we do have a common history we do have a common body of legislation uh and and what we needed to do moving from the privacy directive to the regulation is agree that instead of each country having its own way of looking at it we would have a common way and only manage exceptions to a common law of the land so I, i'm not that surprised because i really think that coming coming out of a common history we all have a similar interest in in thinking the same way when it came to data flow, floating around you know bear in mind and i'm sure you you can relate to this we talk about the eu we talk about countries within the eu but in the us you have a if you look really at the us constitution we have a, a federal government who's really remit in terms of responsibility is always kind of residual to the one of the states the state is really uh, unless the government at the federal level can justify legislating in those areas that are reserved for the federal government all of the rest remains for the states and there's a bit of a battle and competition between the state attorney generals wanting to get their share in the cake in terms of uh, uh, the share in the pie in terms of the privacy of the residents from within the state and the federal government saying well at some point there's enough of an interest that is 
over and beyond the states and across border and uh, that justifies stepping in. But but again, it, it is a lot harder for the federal government to to do this. And I think when you talk about surveillance, you know, uh, surveillance exists in each country. Yeah, let's be real. It does exist. Yeah, I think I think the concern and the perception that maybe the uh, EU was having is that well, it's not so much the activity of surveillance itself, and the and the legitimate reasons why they would want to be able to have those laws as much as whether you have any safeguards, whether you have the ability to oppose that and go before a court of law or oppose one of those. Um, decrees and 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 all of this. I think it's more of the access to the ability to oppose that, uh, rightly or wrongly. We feel that, I mean, from an EU perspective, we do have more of the ability to oppose that if this were found to be the case in, in the EU. And again, we're looking at ourselves uh, from a distance in the US. Do we have standard to sue and go there and, and oppose a uh, a, a mandate from the U.S. government that would ask for that data. So the, I think it's more, it's not the issue of surveillance as much as how this is actually implemented and whatever recourse we have against any of the decisions. Okay, Stefan, so now to take it into the, the business, right? Can we ever get to agree on common standards? Is it poised to fail no matter what? Or do you think that we really should just try, as you're saying, to try and understand that these are different approaches, and that perhaps a U.S. citizen in France, in Spain, would not, after all, get the same sort of redress. Yeah, no, I, I think you're raising a good point. And if you really look at GDPR, again, it's more based on the concept of residency and not the concept of citizenship. Because if you have an American living in the EU whose data is collected, they will be subject to GDPR because when the data is collected, it's collected in the EU. So th there is a difference in the way that the law was built. Um, however, I think there are, and by the way, I think we need to distinguish between FISA and Executive Order 1233, um, uh, 3033, uh, 333, because they have different uh, scopes. And I think on FISA 702, you do have a number of checks and balances, which you don't have to the same extent under the executive order. But yeah, I mean, the, I don't think it's, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, you know, doomed. And I don't think we cannot find a way to to give standard to sue to uh, foreign, um, um, you know, um, users. The reason being that if you really look at executive orders, they they allow themselves to also monitor the activity of, of, of individuals who are not necessarily based on U.S. soil. So I think, you know, and if you look at how that executive order, the new one that just came out, would work is by the US doing an analysis also of the system of surveillance in the EU to see whether they're comparable in one way or another. But what is really interesting in all of that, Sergio, is that this is coming at a time that we see the, um, you know, the federal privacy law uh, it, it, coming into a lot of hurdles because of the political situation in the, in the US, which, uh, you know, in the face of that makes it somehow easier to kind of make decisions from the top down um, because it's impossible to get to a point of of of, uh, of agreement uh, if we were to go to um, Congress and, and legislate at that level. So it's kind of interesting to see the timing of all of this as we are, you know, reaching the midterm elections in the U.S. as well. Very good. Yeah, that's a good point. So all of these systems, you know, everything in marketing technology, advertising technology, there's been so many pieces of technology that brands are used in advertisers, publishers, which are US technology, software as a service, and they've been relying on standard contract clauses. And after SRAMS 2, we had this sort of additional burden. You had to you know, assess whether what was the impact of the transfer, and you needed complementary or supplementary measures, which in the case of the US, pretty much sometimes seem to say that you had to outsmart the US government in terms of encryption. It got to the point that it was pretty bizarre. So uh, where are we now? Because now, of course, the bar should be lower since regardless of what the EU does, there's already an executive order that already says that they'll be more careful in the US. So do you think that's really good news per se? Should people still be skeptical, assuming there'll be a strength three? 
Privacy Shield 2.0 will go down the drain and we need a different system, EU servers, EU technology, as many people seem to be planning for that. You know, I think there's always been good intentions. The issue was never around the good intentions or not. I think the issue was more around how this is being enforced. Um, you know, we've always known that when data is collected from the EU, it's collected subject to the GDPR. Once the data is transferred over to the US, it is managed under the program of, of um, that whatever you, the US agencies run. And I think the, the problem we have with this is because the, um, you know, the fact that you would have to assess the laws that apply in the country of export is also that you know a lot of the discomfort that US companies putting pressure on the government to adopt a new privacy shield is because people have been quick to know that beyond above and beyond the paperwork that is mandated by having to sign SCCs after SCCs after SCCs when really as opposed to rely on the on the privacy shield is also that when you sign the SCCs you are committing to um, you know, uh, protect, protect the data and process the data in accordance with the law of the data exporter, which for many of those U.S. companies means foreign law that they're not familiar with and, and creates additional burdens for them. It's a lot easier to say, I self-certify to a program in the U.S. where ultimately if I mess up, it's all going to be under U.S. law. I'll have to deal with U.S. agencies and I won't have to necessarily uh, commit to comply with European law. And I think a lot of it is... I. I you know, I personally, I, I am pretty skeptical now because I try to really, uh, you know, the adequacy findings typically get reviewed on a four-year basis. When it came to the U.S. one, it's on a yearly basis, and we knew that from the beginning. And it's not so much, oh, do we have a process like the shield that is comparable to the GDPR, as much as how much does the FTC do? And the Department of Commerce to monitor that and audit those companies, and uh, and uh, you don't want to be again. It's the same thing. You're talking a federal agency having to certainly tell a lot of those economic players how to run their business and be there. And and again, it's really it all comes down to what should be the mandate of the federal government when it comes to data in the hands of the private sector. And I think this is where you have that tension. And uh, I think it, to me, it takes more than just good intentions and, and statements of, of intent the way we have them now. And I think the devil's going to have to be in the detail on how this is going to be uh, working on a, on a, on, on, on a practical um, point of view. And I think we are far off knowing the details of that to yet to speculate at this point, I think. Does it make sense to you, perhaps? And this just came to mind, but that we split the a privacy framework as it applies to private companies, corporations, and how the relationship between people and businesses. So that perhaps there's an easy way for companies to comply across the board. So California, Colorado, Utah, all of these state laws, and hopefully a federal privacy law. And the certain things that you know will happen no matter what, either, you know, whether you are in France or whether you are in, in you know, again, in Utah, there's certain things you can expect from, from privacy protection. And there'll be tiny little differences, but as it's happening with the global privacy control, opt-out, certain things start to look a bit the same and even better sometimes in the US for certain for, for how practical they are. And then a separate sort of uh, framework for US and EU and whatever and governmental data, or I'd say for governmental uh, access to personal data, where it seems like we get into the political arena, it's much harder. If the political uh, element hadn't been mixed up, perhaps we would have something that was running parallel to trade agreements that's happening with other countries. Uh, does it make sense to you that perhaps we have a different treatment for surveillance, we can agree on what countries are doing and should be doing, perhaps that's you know, day trading. Yes. As you know, I'm a European and a, and a U.S., but also a Canadian privacy lawyer, and uh, Canada has taken that path. Canada has actually two different legislations, one for the public sector, one for the private sector. Um, and and PIPIDA, you know, which is really what served as the adequacy finding for 
uh, Canada was actually treated very differently looking at it from an EU perspective than it is in the, with the Federal Privacy Act, which is really dealing with public sector access to data. So yes, I mean, having maybe something that is focused on the industry and understand sometimes some of the constraints and the limitations and, and some of the, the user cases um, of, of uh, private use to data, maybe one way to look at it and, and maybe one way to get to a point of agreement that goes above and beyond that political arena here when you have states fighting with the federal government in the US and never getting to a point of a agreement, you know, but but how much can this be left in the end? In, because who is ultimately responsible for the private sector? That's the problem, right? I mean, the federal government doesn't have that mandate. You can look at it by the state, um, every state looking at treating privacy differently when it's private sector versus um, uh, the public sector, why, why not? But I, I do find looking at uh, privacy in Canada versus the US versus Europe, that the that the Canadian approach is a bit of a middle way between the way the EU looks at it and the US looks at it. And maybe that's maybe something worth exploring. Maybe that's it. We'll follow the Canadian way. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks again, Sergio. Okay, that's all for today. And you will find some episode notes and links to our social channels on mastersofprivacy.com. Thank you for listening.